I am Talia Mehmet Esenzade from SPB OCS team. Today I will be your moderator during the session. So uh, this is the last week of the process engineering course and today's lesson will be uh, with San Sanan Suleyman. He will share his experience. And now stage is yours. Uh, when you have any questions, you can write to the chat box or just unmute yourself and ask your question. So uh, Sanan, you can start. Thank you, Talia Hanım, for the introduction. I would like to greet all of you. Thank you for joining this session. Last week we had a, not last week, yeah, on Sunday, we had the first session of the, the refine, oil refiner processes course where we talked about the, the oil refining, why we are refining the oil, what are the outcomes, uh, what is the, the view and the blow flow diagram of the oil uh, refinery and I gave an assignment which was uh, which was about to learn the to learn the processes in general but not numerous but to understand why block flow diagram looks like that now I would like to share my screen but before before I started I uh, told Kafia Hanım that today there will be a quiz which will be the the end of the our sessions but Later, I thought that if I try to finalize the sessions today, that would be too intense for today. Uh, that's why we will probably have one more session and that will be, we can discuss that will be on Sunday. Uh, at the end of the session, we will have a quiz, which will be the, the, the questions will be today's this session and Sunday's this session. Uh, and for the highest score, uh, I want to promise a, a surprise gift, which will be from Sokar. That's why uh, be careful, uh, listen carefully, ask your questions, take notes during the, the session. If you have any questions, please don't do not hesitate to, uh, to bother me. Ask your questions. You can ask your questions with just speaking or writing your messages in the chat box. Let me share my presentation. So this is the, the how oil refiner looks like. And this is not just a plant, this is a complex. And what I, yes. So what we said in the previous session that the oil refiner co consists of different units. Now I made a square here. Each square is kind of one unit. This is one unit, this is one unit, this is one unit or two units, and there are some other units in this area. So now I will show you the, the block flow diagram, which all you already saw that. So each, the, the square in the block diagram is a unit, and each unit has all different types of equipment, such as pumps, compressors, columns, the, the reactors, furnaces, heaters, heat exchangers, etc. So one unit, can consist of between the 50 or uh, 500 pieces of equipment. This is what is the unit when we say in the refinery. So I would like to again the, the show this slide that how engineers learn. Engineers do not memorize, they think, they analyze, they understand, and this is how they learn. This take this takes longer than memorizing, but in fact, this lasts longer. And after you learn, you repeat what you learn. For instance, you take notes and you repeat your notes. You reproduce, maybe doing the assignments, and teach others. When you teach others, you must learn here. And if you do all of them, then you remember. So, as I told you in the first session that I used the petroleum refining complex guide to products and process course on Udemy. I mostly used their the presentation slides and I added some slides from the reference book I used. This is the oil refinery block flow diagram that we discussed uh, during the last session. Now I would like to summarize it briefly because it is really important to understand the processes in the BFD first, and then we go the one by one each unit. So this is, where, where is it? 
Yeah. This is one unit. Gas processing, another unit. Amine, amine treating, another unit. The lead cooker, this is another unit. So we, these are the main refinery units. This is CDU. This is video. One moment, why it is so small? Okay, I couldn't make it uh, thicker. And we have video, this is video. Fluid catalytic, catalytic cracking unit, this is FCC. Can you see my writing, my notes? Yes, Sanam, we can see okay. it. Okay. And continuous catalytic reforming unit. This is CCR. Here we have CCR. The naphtha hydro treating unit. So we have the hydro treater. This is NHD. We have different hydro treaters. This is the NHD, naphtha hydro treater. You have DHD, which is the diesel hydro treater, and we have no, this is not FCC. Sorry, FCC is this one. This is we called it VGO. So you can see it is vacuum gas oil, vacuum gas oil mix of light and heavy VGO. That's why we called it VGO HD, VGO hydro treater, and not the splitter. Naphtha splitter actually splits light naphtha and this. Oops, sorry. Splits light naphtha and heavy naphtha. And then we have the isomerization unit, which is this one. And we have the bitumen blowing unit. Here we have the BBU to produce the bitumen and the late cocaine unit to produce cocks. Okay, let's go one by one quickly to understand the, the blood flow diagram. Who attended the first session? That will be easier for you. That will be repetition for you. Who is the first time in the in the refinery uh, oil refinery processing course? Uh, please uh, listen carefully and try to understand. Why we have the atmospheric distillation unit, which is the today's main topic, to, to, to separate the, the products related to their uh, boiling points. As you can see, we have the gases here, which are C1, C4. We have light naphtha and heavy naphtha. Light naphtha is C5, C8, and heavy naphtha C10, C12. And then we have the, the jet fuel or kerosene, which is the C12 to 18, diesel, the C20 to C30, then atmospheric gas oil, or we can also call it the AR, atmospheric residue. Atmospheric residue. Sorry. Can I ask a question? Yes, sure. Uh, we call them. Uh, as atmospheric because it uh, goes out at atmospheric pressure or there yes. is another reason? Yes, exactly. So here the pressure is around uh, 1 bar G or 1 ATM ga gauge pressure. And when it comes to here, the pressure is around, uh, let's say, 30, 50 millimeter uh, mercury. So as you can, as you know, 1 ATM is 760 mmHg. In this case, the 50 is around uh, 0 0.05 bar G. And we discuss, we will talk about this later in details because today we will learn the CDU and VDU. We will talk about these units mostly. That's why the, we will talk about the pressure, temperatures, and other the equipment in these units further. So this is the atmospheric bottoms or atmospheric residue. 
which is further separated to the light vacuum gas oil, heavy vacuum gas oil. Sometimes we also have years diesel, which is sent here. So the aim of the CDU and VDU is to separate the products based on their boiling point. Finally, we have the vacuum ready to, and it is sent to the lead coke unit to produce coke, coke or bitumen, asphalt. So asphalt is our one product, coke another product. When we have these products separated, now they have to be treated. Why? Because the, they have the high amount of sulfur content mostly, and also the, the nitrogen content. These impurities should be treated. That's why we have the hydro treaters for each product. And then we send light naphtha to isomerization, heavy naphtha to catalytic reformer. Here we produce the aromatics. Aromatics. Here the, we produce the isomerate. Why we do that? Because the isomerate has higher octane number than light naphtha and reformate has higher octane number than heavy naphtha. Then all the isomate reformate are sent to gasoline blending pool. It's a gas, gas processing plant. We have the gases from C1 to C4. What we do, we treat them. We clean the sulfur in gases and also we split them split them to C1 and C2, which is dry gas, C3, which is called the propane-propylene reaction, and C4, which is called the butylene, butane-butylene reaction. And we have other gases here. What are other gases? Gases from FCC, gas from catalytic reformer, gas from hydro-treating, gas from isomerization plant, gas from hydro-treater, gas from hydro-treater, gas, gas, and gas. All the gases in refinery are collected in one gas processing, let's say, unit. There, we split it to dry gas, PPF, and BBF, and we treat them, we clean them. Dry gas is used as fuel in the refinery, and PPF and BBF are sent to sales. When we treat H2S in the dry gas, uh, we absorb H2S with amine treating, and H2S is sent to the class sulfur plant, or you can call like sulfur recovery unit. Where, where we produce sulfur. <clears throat> and then you can ask why we have the FCC. We will talk about FCC in detail in the next session. In FCC, we crack the higher hydrocarbons with higher carbon chain, 20 or 30, to lower ones. Why to produce the more gasoline? This is the FCC. We produce gasoline. You can see NAFTA, it is hydro treated and sent to FCC gasoline, to gasoline pool. So this hydro treated will be called GHT, for instance. Why? G gasoline hydro treated. And then we have the FCC gas oil. This is diesel. And that's all. We have also sometimes that we call it the slurry, which is the really heavy fraction, slurry is sent to the red copper unit. This is the BFT in general. I spoke, spoke about it quickly because we, uh, we went over this BFT one by one in the previous session. If you didn't attend that one, you can ask for the recording and watch it. Now I would like to continue. If you have any question, please ask.
okay? Just as site information, these are the main units, but we have also some auxiliary refinery units, which are the hydrogen production units. Why we need hydrogen? Because hydro treating means that treating with hydrogen. For these units, we need hydrogen. You can see hydrogen here, you can see hydrogen. And this hydrogen comes from catalytic reformer here. We produce hydrogen, but this hydrogen is not enough. That's why we have additional hydrogen production unit, which is shown here. This is HPU, hydrogen production unit, where we use the natural gas and steam to produce hydrogen. We have the pressure swing adsorption. Why we need this one? Be to produce the high purity hydrogen. So you can assume like that we have low purity hydrogen to swing absorption block, pressure swing absorption, where other gases in hydrogen is absorbed, and then we produce high purity hydrogen. This is around 99.9%. .9%. This can be around 84%. Then we have the silver recovery, which I talked about. We have sore water stripping. In. What is that? The water, sore water, what is sore means that high H2S content is sent to SWS. What is stripping? Just kind of evaporating. You evaporate the H2S and separate H2S from water. Then what we do, we send water to waste water treatment plant where we treat the water, we clean all the impurities, the hydrocarbons, we also treat it biologically. And then we send water to, let's say, Caspian Sea. Or we don't have it uh, in Azerbaijan, in Baku. We have wastewater treatment plant, but we don't have reverse osmosis. If you have reverse osmosis, you can also use it as a drinkable water. And then what we do with this H2S? Can anyone answer me? We separated H2S from water, then what we should do with H2S? Just you can say what you think. It might be correct or, right, uh, or wrong. Maybe uh, sent to the Klaus sulfur plant as other yeah. gas. Yes, yes, exactly. Thank you for your answer. As I showed here, we have H2S, which is sent to the sulfur recovery unit or sulfur production unit. So it is sent to SRU. We have sulfur. And sulfur is sent for sales. As you can see, there is no waste at the refinery. Everything is used, everything is refined as much as possible to produce the, all the products you can see in blue. Methyl tertbutyl ether production unit. This is the, can be purchased as a chemical or you can have the, the separate unit for this product. Why we need this one? MTB has research of the number of 120 or 116. This can be added to gasoline pool. To have the, the 95 and 98 gasoline. For instance, the in Baku refinery, we didn't have MTB unit, 
And at, in, in, in Baku refinery, we produced uh, 92 research octane number gasoline. But now, because there is a revamp project, we are now building MTB unit. And when this unit is ready, we will be able to produce the 95 gasoline as well. Uh, Sanon Bey, could you please say it, what is a uh, research of number? What, research, what does it stand for? So there are octane number. So it is wrong research octane number. And MON, which is motor octane number. So between RON and MON, there is around, let's say like this, delta is around 10. So research means that the, the theoretical octane number which can be calculated. Motor octane number is calculated with the motor or engine. For instance, in Azerbaijan, at the petroleum stations, you see RON, 92 or 95. But if MON is written, then that would, that would be 82, 85. In USA, USA, it is written like that, RON plus MON divided by two. Is it answer to your question? Yes, yes, thank you. I haven't known until now what does it mean in the stationaries, but now I, uh, okay. I caught it. Thank you. You are welcome. And petroleum refining. So why we refine oil to produce these products? Starting from gases to the bitumen and asphalt. And we will have the preheating, we will have the side products, we will have the single column. This is the single column col uh, crude distillation column. And then after we separate all the products, then we send it to them the rectifi rectifying the columns or the stabilizers. Now we will talk about this in detail. So as you can see, the, the, the products starting from off gas to vacuum residue have the boiling points of this one. End point, it's also written like end boiling point. So NAFTA has in boiling point of 180, then the kerosene 240. Then you can also think like that. NAFTA, we have the initial boiling point and end boiling point. NAFTA has initial boiling point of around 30, end boiling point is 180. Then kerosene, as 180 to 240. And then light diesel, 240, 340, and so on. So kerosene means that kerosene is not a pure substance. It's also a mixture. But kerosene has such hydrocarbons that when you boil them, they will start to boil at 180 degrees and all the kerosene will be evaporated when you have the temperature of 240 degrees. This continues like that. And then you can also see the specific gravity also increases starting from 0 0.6 to nearly one. The water, you know, water specific gravity is one. And crude oil is around 
it can be different. We discussed it in previous session that the crude oil can have the, the different specific gravity. There can be light crude oils or heavy crude oils, but the, in Bakul refinery, we have around this 0.875. So it is somewhere here in between atmospheric gas oil and vacuum gas oil. When you separate the light products from the heavy products, the density distribution seems like this one. But we also discussed in previous previous session that naphtha, kerosene, and diesel. These are the, the products are called the transportation fuels, which add the, the most contribution to profit. That's why you always try to produce as much as naphtha, kerosene, and diesel, especially, especially naphtha and diesel, because you cannot the play with the kerosene amount. It is what it is in the crude oil, but you can play with the naphtha and diesel amount. That's why you try to produce these fuels as much as possible to earn more money. Crude oil distillation. Crude oil starts from here. We have atmospheric distillation. We have vacuum distillation. And then this is uh, the different uh, different view of the BFD again. We will talk about these, these the, the sub-sessions. Again, one, two, three, four. What is one? Crude oil storage. We have crude oil storage here. It is sent to furnace. This is the furnace. Two. It is sent to CDU. This is the crude Let's say atmospheric distillation, ADU, I will write like that. And then fractional distillation, then vacuum flashing, it is vacuum flashing. These are the, your products. These are sent to different units. Crude oil distillation, you can see the, the distillation column at the right hand side. We have the primary separation processes and secondary conversion processes. Secondary conversion processes, which we we'll talk about uh, in the next session, will be FCC, will be CCR, will be ISO, DCU, BBU, etc. The conversion of some of the hydrocarbons into products having higher quality performance. So what we said, we said that we want to produce more transportation oils. For instance, FCC, we have the vacuum gas oil, which is the product from vacuum, heavy product. Go back. This is the vacuum gas oil. You crack vacuum gas oil in FCC to naphtha, and diesel. Atmospheric and vacuum distillation of crude oils is the main primary separation process. So, uh, CDU and VDU are physical processes. Because we only separate the products, there is no conversion, no chemical reaction there. This is the crude atmospheric distillation unit. So as I said in the previous session that the crude oil com consists of the 10, 100 compounds and more, and we have to separate them for their, mm, based on their boiling points. So starting from 30 to 180, this is naphtha or gasoline. From 180 to 260, you can see the different uh, boiling points in different photos because they are from different references. In previous one, it was 240, now it is 260, but this is okay. It, it depends on the spec, product spec, what you want to achieve. This is kerosene or jet fuel, then you have diesel fuel oil, lubricating oil, 
and residue. And the most important part in crude oil distillation part, also in the refiner, is heat recovery. As you can see, it says a preheated crude oil is sent to fire heater. Then we have the, this temperature around 400 degrees Celsius. It is sent to crude oil distillation tower. Here it is flashed, stripped, and we separate the products. Gas, naphtha, kerosene, light fuel oil, heavy fuel oil. This can also be uh, called as diesel and residue. Raise it to, to where? To vacuum distillation unit. Pretreatment of crude oil. So crude oil comes from the ground, which contains variety of substances such as gases, water, dirt, and mineral. As you can see, this is the, the crude oil. But this is also crude oil with emulsion. This is sand, water, and I will call it pure crude oil. Of course, the water content is not that high in the crude oil, but this is just illustration for you that how it can be separated. Once you add the, the demulsifier to make emulsions, then when once you make the emulsions, you can separate it in let's say three phase separator. Why you pretreat the crude oil? Because the to prevent falling and corrosion in the subsequent operations. You don't want to damage your equipment. That's why it is first pretreated, then it is further processed. So I add this slide that when I send the, the presentation to you, you can read it. I just want to skip this part because we have much more to talk about uh, in the process side. Crude dissolving. Go back to here. Before it is sent to fire heater, we have dissolver here. The question to you. Why we need to dissolving crude? Why we cannot just send it to a distillation tower immediately? Any idea? Uh, because in in uh, inside the let's say crude oil we have um, chloride salts or um, let's say the, some impurities. That's why we need to dissolve it um, because then uh, it will it will affect the corrosion in the pipelines. Yes, exactly. Thank you. So the salt can deposit inside the tubes of the furnaces. So your answer was one of the, the let's say three or four the possible answers. Salt deposit inside the tubes because you know that the, inside the heat exchangers we have small diameter tubes. Diameter can be around maybe five millimeter or ten. So these are these are small. There's salt deposit inside the tubes of the furnaces and on the tube bundles of heat exchange. They can deposit here. So that will uh, decrease your heat transfer efficiency. This creates the falling. This can uh, result in corrosion. And also, this is also really important. The salts carried with the product act as catalyst poisons in catalytic cracking unit. So catalytic cracking, it is FCC. FCC, chemical process. It is chemical process, so it has the catalyst, because it is fluidized catalytic cracking. And this salt can poison the catalyst. Catalyst is expensive, and also it really determines the whole process is going on. If the catalyst is poisoned, then you have to shut down the, the whole refinery, remove the catalyst, renew it, which costs a lot.
Okay, I will explain the process like uh, here. We have the crude coming and we add wash water here. The question to you, we want, why we add wash water? We don't want water in, in the because, because Yes, please. We need, we need to create some uh, sea level for um, increasing our sea level. Then uh, we uh, separate our salt from the oil. Mm, not exactly. Do you have it? Does anyone has another idea? So it is dissolting. There is something relationship between salt and water. Water and salt can salt can be um, dissolved in water easily. Maybe we yeah. separate them by uh, dissolving salts in the water. Yes, exactly. So this is the more correct answer. We add wash water to dissolve the salt first, and then. Once the, the salt is dissolved in the water, we can separate it in with water. We use the electrodes here to separate the water and the crude. We have buffers or deflectors here, and this is the crude collector. The salted crude leaves from top and water leaves from bottom. What kind of chemicals should we also add here to make the, the water crude interface clearer or better interface? What kind of chemical to create the emulsion here? Maybe surfactant? Surfactant is more about the, the in interfacial, but yes, here we add the demulsifier. Surfactant is used to control the surface tension of the liquid, but here we need demulsifier. Why? Going back here. You can wait for a long time, for one hour, then you will see, you will get this one. But demulsifier helps you to create the emulsion in a short time. That's why we add the demulsifier. Let's say in one minute, you can create this emulsion. Once you have this emulsion, it is easier to separate the oil and water. Even the emulsifier is not added here. It is added before crude is mixed with water. Here you can see it is says that water crude emulsion. And then the commercial crude salt content is around the 10 to 20 ppb. What is ppb? Parts per billion. Yeah. So it is 1000 ppm. What is ppm? Parts per million. Yeah, exactly. So then one ppm, how many percentage is it? Ten to the minus. There are two types of desalting, single, multi-stage. Single desalting is not used mostly because it is not enough to clean all the salts until the, the, the desired level. The refiners aim at 5 ppp. This is this number is so low. That's why most of the time we use the two-stage desalters. Two-stage desalting is required. A high degree of salt removal is desired. 95-99% removal of the dissolved salt in the crude oil. So stage of desalting, we first heat, we mix and settle down. It is heated to 130-140 degrees in the train of the heat exchanger. 
And then we mix. Single stage desalting with water recycle is usually justified if salt content in crude less than 40 ppb. So if it is less than 40 ppb, then we use the single stage. But if it is higher, then we use the double stage. Double stage desalting is also better for residuum hydrotreating. In later stage, it is better for hydrotreating. In this case, the fuel oil quality is better. As I told you, we form the emulsion of crude and water, and then we separate the salt dissolved in water. I think, yes. These are the desalters. You can see in the photo, the both of them are desalters. And the operating variables in desalting, the current charge rate, temperature and pressure, mixing valve, pressure drop. Where is the mixing valve? Do you remember? Where do you think that there can be mixing valve? See here we mixer. So we have heated crude oil. We add the emulsifier here. And then we add water and we have mixing valve. Most of them it is static mixing valve that helps to mix the crude and water. Wash water rate and temperature, wash quality and dissolving voltage. It is we have the electrodes, it is electrostatic desalter. That's why the voltage is also important here. This is the, another photo of the desalter, which you can see the inside of the desalter. We have the high voltage insulators, upper line electrodes, crude oil outlet, process pressure vessel, and where is water outlet? It is not shown. We have water inlet, food inlet. The water outlet is not shown here. So this is the PFD of the desalter. So typically two stage desalters are used. We have the unrefined crude. We have the water, which comes from the second stage. And we have mixing valve electrodes first stage. We have the wash process water. And process water is added to the, let's say, second stage. We use the recycled water in the first stage. Do you know why or any idea why we do that? We could also do the vice versa, use the processed water, fresh water in the first stage, and then use the recycled water from first stage in the second stage. Why we don't do that, but we do this way. Maybe if we would um, first we add it to the first line, more uh, salt will be dissolved, uh, salt dissolved in water. Water will, wouldn't be such useful uh, for the dissolving process, but if we add it in the second stage, uh, less water will be, uh, less salt will be dissolved, so it is not doymamış mahlul emele gelir sanki. Yes. Biz yine halleliyebilirik. Yine tuz halleliyebilirik. Yes. Thank you for your answer. That is the one point. Another point is that I am interested in this dissolved crude. So this is my spec, they say 2 P, P, B. And that's why this uh, crude, the product from the second stage is much more important for me. That's why I'm using the fresh water in the second stage to make sure that I can separate or I can dissolve all the salts. And then, as you said, from the second stage, we already have the less salt because of the first stage, we can use the recycled water in the first stage. And then the desalted crude is sent to distillation tower. 
furnace and crevflash. Most of the time we have furnaces before the distillation columns because we need to, to achieve the temperature, desired temperature first. Let's say here it's around the 400 degrees. To achieve this one, we need the furnace. But we also pre-flash. Pre-flash can be like this one. So this is, as you can see, we have the furnace. And then it is sent to column. But let's see, this is the main column. I can add here pre-flash column. Why do you think I need this one? What do you understand when you when you hear pre-flash? So pre-flash means that the separating gases from the stream. I have main stream here. So pre-flash, I can separate the gases here. And then I have liquid here, which can be sent to furnace. Then I do not have this one. It helps me to separate the gases and I heat lower amount of feed into the main column. This way I can reduce the, the power or the required fuel of my furnace. That's why we can use the pre-flash column. Now I will talk about the, the burners. The preheated crude from the preheater section is further heated and partially vaporized in the furnace containing tubular heater. The tube, this is the tubular. The, you can see the tubes here. They have a kind of a circle like that. So that for the most uh, efficient heater. So the furnaces has two zones. The main zone here, where you have the burners, all the fire, this is called the radiant section. But after this one, this is the, the main part. This is the second part is convection section. Convection section. How we can use a convection se section for heating? Do you have any idea? Okay. So the burners for burners we use the fuel gas. It can be C1, C2, sometimes even the C3, C4, the, the LPG is used. And we need air, of course. We need oxygen. These are around the 25 degrees, ambient temperature, 25 degrees. But once they are burned, they leave the, the radiant section as flu gases. What are flu gases? What type of gases in this in the flue gases? Who can tell me? What's the composition of flue gases? Okay, I will tell you. So a air is oxygen and nitrogen. The fuel gas they say it is carbohydrogen, hydrocarbon. Then when carbon is burned, we have the CO2. When hydrogen is burned, we have H2O. Oxygen we use for the burning, and we have nitrogen. This gases has around temperature of, I don't know, up to 200 degrees Celsius, even higher. And you have hot flue gases, hot the, the gases. Then you can add some more tubes here. In convection section, you use the heat from the flue gases to heat your other streams. Even you can produce here steam. 
you have water inlet and because of the high temperature it leaves as the steam and then the, your flue gases leaves the convection section at the 120 celsius so all the furnaces have two sections radiant section and convection section in radiant section you have the the burners main fire where you have the main the heating area of the tubes and these tubes leave the furnaces but in the convection section you can heat the streams that has lower temperatures that this is the part of the the pre flash column where you have heat you have flash zone you have the bush oil slope marks which are the different products in our case we will have the kerosene we will have the nafta etc the this over the has a function of the providing liquid wash to the vapors going up the column from the flash zone so here vapor goes up and you have the liquid comes down the over flash provides the heat input to the column in excess to that needed to distill the overhead products you can see that you have here the, the distillation column which we will talk about in detail later here yeah. separate the nafta kerosene diesel the atmosphere gas oil and residue but also it is really important to control the outlet temperature furnace outlet temperature to keep cooking inside the, the furnace tubes and also avoid cooking in the column flash zone to a minimum you don't want to uh, have lower temperature because if you have a lower temperature then you have poorer distillation but you don't want really higher temperature then you might have the cooking or you can have the cracking that you want to prevent the composition of the crude plays a part in determining the maximum temperature allowed why because we know that we have the light crude and we have heavy crude that's why this temperature can be different for each type of crude. For instance, the also composition of the crude can be different. The the the, the paraffinic, I mean the, the content of the some crude are more paraffinic, some crude are more aromatic, etc. Paraffinic crude oil cracks more readily than an aromatic or asphalt based crude. In this case, you have the lower temperature to prevent the the cracking of the paraffinic crude oil. Furnace and preflash, these are the, the furnaces and these are the stack. You can see the, the flue gases go up from here and then <clears throat> leaves the furnace in the stack to the atmosphere. The heavy fraction of the crude oil leaves the, from the bottom section of the pre-flash tower and both streams have higher, lighter. I want to skip these parts and talk about the heat exchanger network. Uh, I'm you... so sorry. Can, uh, yes, yes, I have a question. Could you please yes. uh, go back to the previous slides, which was cooking? Yes, cooking. Yes. This one? Mm, cooking the previous one. one. I have cooking here. Uh huh. Yes, yes. Keep cooking inside the furnace tubes. This uh, this cooking is the such uh, refiner process unit or uh, the cooking in the heater. The problem, let's say, in the heater. The cooking cooking is process. Here we call it's like process. a process, which actually <clears throat> we are, you are right. We have also DCU, which is the delayed cooker unit. So what we do in DCU, we have a special reactor and we produce coke. Coke is like, I don't know, stone 
or the in the reactor it becomes like a stone then we with high pressure steam we crack it down to like sand sand coke so but what happens in the furnace tube is that we have coking so let's say if they are coking here here solid hydrocarbon formation here it is formed here it is really like a stone and then this reduces heat efficiency and then you can also have problem if this becomes bigger and bigger then there is no way for your fluid to pass it through did, did i answer your question or your yes. question was yes yeah. it's clear it's, i asked so the second one this cooking is kind of similar to this cooking but here we have the special reactor and we want to cook we produce coke but in other units, we want to prevent cooking. Who has an idea? What is HEN or Heat Exchanger Network? Heat Exchanger Network, kind of the network of the a number of heat exchangers. Six. 8, 10, etc. As you can see, we have two heat exchanger network in crude distillation. One before the desolder and the second after the desolder. The crude comes, let's say, around the 225 degrees Celsius. And then, if you remember, who remembers the, the temperature we need for the desolder? At least you can say what you remember. 130. So we use what we use here. Uh, okay, I will continue. And then it lives around the same the, the degree Celsius, the disorder, and we have the heat exchanger network too. And then furnace to pre-flash column. From pre-flash column, we have the main column. We can use the pre-flash column the before furnace or after the furnace. But in this case, in this case, we have the gases here and liquid here. It try it helps us for better distillation. After the furnace, we know that it is 400 degrees Celsius. Before the furnace, it is around uh, 280 degrees Celsius. We use the lighter products such as the naphtha and kerosene in order to heat crude oil in the first preheating train. This is called the preheating train. Train one, and this is the second one. We have the called crude oil, we want to heat it, preheat it, and we use the lighter products to heat crude oil. We also cool down the lighter products. Later we will see that after this, naphtha and kerosene is sent to air coolers and the coolers, the water coolers, to cool them until the desired temperature. We use the heavier products because heavier products have also higher specific gravity and they have the higher heat. We use the heavier products to preheat crude to the furnace inlet temperature. We use the HGO. You can see the, the dashed lines. LGO, LGO is light gas oil. HGO is heavy gas oil. Gas oil is diesel, light diesel, heavy diesel, and residue. A question, assume we don't have HEN2, what will happen?
Uh, can I ask a question before? Yes, sir. Before yes, sir. Uh -huh. uh, so if we want to increase the temperature uh, to 130 degree uh, yes. in the dissolved, let's say operating temperature. So uh, can we use only one heat exchanger? Because I think it will be more cost effective than the heat exchanger network. So if we want to use the one heat exchanger, that that <laughs> exchanger will be so big, first of all. OK, all the heat exchanger will have the same size because the crude passes through all of them. But you don't have so much heat in one stream where you will take that one. Because the why it passes through different heat exchangers, because the heat exchanger, heat exchanger duty is limited. You and, know that uh, Q, the, uh -huh. Q is, and Q is duty in two or three heat exchangers it means yes exactly so oh. q the heat exchanger duty is mass flow rate it's, times specific uh -huh. heat times delta temperature uh -huh. and this is limited for each let's say nafta mass flow rate is limited kerosene is limited and cp is specific for each you cannot do anything for cp that's why you cannot have only one heat exchanger because then this heat duty heat will not be enough. That's why you have a couple of heat exchangers. You can see that the first you have lightest product, NAFTA. The second you have the heavier product, kerosene. Here again, the first you have the lightest product, light diesel. Second, even second is the pump around, pump around, we will talk about later. Heavy gas oil, and then finally you have the, the residue. Because the, you increase the temperature, you need more heat duty to increase it more. That's why, and this heat duty comes from the heavier products. And but, what about the, uh, how much, let's say, temperature is recommendable? to increase in one heat exchanger in terms of industry, let's say. There, there is no such limitation. It, I mean, the outlet temperature is not what you calculate. It is your result. And for heat exchange network, you can design the what is. What is important is heat recovery. The percentage of heat recovery. If you can recover 90%, that is really good. It means that for the rest 10% or the, you use the coolers, water coolers, or you use the heaters. It means that you can use the 90% of the heat in your unit, but for the 10%, you have to use the cooling water or fuel gas as heater. This is important. And if you have, let's say, one to three heat exchangers, you can even uh, make the best heat exchanger network. In design course, people do that uh, even at Paco High Royal School or the other engineering universities. But if you have many heat exchangers, then you probably need a, a simulation such as the Aspen HISIS to have the, the best heat exchanging network. It decides the which streams you should have heat exchanged. But there is no such a limitation that this should be the maximum delta temperature for the heat exchanger. OK. Yes, yes, it's clear. OK, then uh, let's come to back to my question. If you don't have hand two, what will be? Um, we will need to increase the um, furnace load or the, yes, for example, exactly. we need some. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, some, continue. continue. Um, for example, we need some uh, components at high temperature to uh, give it to the furnace burning and creating heating process, but if we uh, heat it beforehand, we will need a uh, lower load. Exactly. Exact answer. I will not add anything here. Thank you very much for your answer.
Let's continue. This is heat exchange. Sorry, and I can yes. I ask a question? Yes, um, sure. First, we also use the heat of the residue, but uh, the residue has high, for example, high thickness. It it is. Um, I thought it is hard to move it through pipelines. Um, how we can use its heat in the heat exchanger? Isn't hard to use its heat to move it through pipelines to the heat exchanger then? So the thank you for your question. To answer your question, I will go back. So atmos uh, vacuum residue has higher density, and you are the you are right that it is hard to move the vacuum not vacuum residue. It was atmospheric residue, not shown here. Atmospheric residue. I will write AR. 0 and 0 0.9 and uh, if it is the high viscose or the too hard to move in the pipeline we most of the time add steam there to move them however the it has also high temperature one moment sorry I lost my pen. I'm sorry for the for the disturbance. I have to. My PowerPoint slides stopped working. Try to solve it. Uh, atmospheric residue as a specific gravity of 0 0.9. You are right that it is hard to move the atmospheric residue or higher the density products in the pipelines, but we also have to consider that they have the temperature of the around 400 degrees Celsius or even more. Uh, when the temperature is higher, this helps lower viscosity so with lower viscosity we can easily move them in the pipelines if we have the the temperature goes down the below 100 celsius then we will have a problem to move them in the pipelines sometimes it happens that the, they see that it is it can be dried or to just kind of the make make solid. It happens to uh, to act like a solid. That's why they add steam in this case. Did I answer your question? Uh -huh. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your question. So now it is the heat exchanger network. You can see that crude is sent to heat exchangers parallelly with two pumps and these are the the products that we use in heat exchangers this is is hen one and as you can see 
the heat is transferred from hot product, jet fuel, atmos uh, gas oil, kerosene, etc., to crude oil, and then we also cool down these products. After the heat exchangers, we have the air coolers or even the, the water coolers to bring the products to the desired temperature at the battery limit. And then it is sent to desalting. After desalting, we have the N2. Here we have only two heat exchangers, but it it can be different for different systems. And how your system will look like, this is done by pinch analysis. You will learn it, I think, in your design course. And then heat exchanger network. Uh, as I told you, for more heat exchangers, the, the Aspen Hisis is really useful to make this network for most heat recovery. I will skip this one and CD video. So we have the first heat exchanger network. We have the salting. We have the second heat exchanger network. Then we have the furnace. And then we have here crude oil enters the atmospheric distillation unit at around 400 degrees Celsius. This is 720 already. So the crude oil distillation consists of atmospheric and vacuum distillation. And atmospheric distillation, as I told you, the have these products. And then we have the AR, atmospheric residue, which is also sent to furnace to heat it more. And then we have the vacuum distillation. LVGO is light and heavy vacuum gas oil. Okay, what we do with LVGO and HVGO? Where it is sent? Who remembers? It is sent to fluid catalytic cracking unit to crack them down to produce more transportation fuels. We said that we have preheating, we said we desalting, furnace, preflash, it, it, uh, we have preflash in some of the units, but we don't have in others. So that's why it is optional. We have distillation column. This is the, the overview of the products where you can see that you have the temperature, EIBP, e initial boiling point and final boiling point for atmospheric column, and then we have the, the vacuum column. The CDU main column is typically 50 meter high. This is uh, the CDU, and this is the VDU. And the, it has around a 30 to 50 valve trays. Crude is fed at the lower point. Crude is fed around here. And from here, you have the atmospheric residue. This is the flash zone. This is the stripping zone. And then we have the, the side strippers as well. This is above what's called the stripping section. Heating inside vapor flow high rate requires large diameter column above the flashing zone. So above the flashing zone here, you need the large diameter. At the bottom of the stripping section, steam is injected. The why steam is injected? We steam, we have steam here. Why? Because it will strip the atmospheric residue of any lighter carbon. Our what we want to do, our aim is to separate. transportation fuels as much as possible from heavy residue. What are the transportation fuels? Nafta or gasoline. We have jet fuel. And we have diesel or gas oil. I 
I will continue more quickly because it is already seven. I want to finish this presentation, but the, the slides I skip, you can read them later and ask me your questions via email or in the next session. We have size strippers and we have pump around. Why we need pump around? You can see we have one, two, three, four, five. Pump rounds help us to control the temperature. We can control the temperature here and control the temperature here, 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 and here. As you can see, the we take the product here, kerosene product. This is the side stripper, one, two, three. And then the some of the kerosene is sent back to the column. This helps to control the temperature here. Why we need this one? Because the, for kerosene, let's say we have the 180, 0.40. This is our spec. We want to achieve this one. And this it, these are the cuts, if you remember. To achieve this one, we need the, to control the temperature. And this is reflux. So you cool the naphtha, and then some of them leaves as a product and the rest is sent to the top of the column to control the temperature there. And it applies the same to pump around four and five. And bottom one, as you can see, we don't have a reboiler here. Atmospheric residue is directly sent to vacuum distillation. These pump arounds have the, I, I think, Yes, the, when the heat exchanger symbol is gray like this, it's a part of crude oil preheat exchangers. As you can see, these heat exchangers are part of the heat exchanger network here. We preheat the, the crude oil heat exchanger. And these side streams, we add steam here to strip the lighter products. Let's say we have the kerosene here. What is the lighter product is naphtha. What is it? Yes, naphtha. If there is naphtha left in the kerosene, we can strip it with steam. If kerosene is left in light gas oil, we strip it with steam and so on. All of these products are withdrawn above their heat tray. So here it is withdrawn, here it is withdrawn, and here it is withdrawn. The atmospheric residue is withdrawn from the bottom. So this is the atmospheric residue where it is withdrawn. This is the, the block flow diagram. We discussed it uh, before. And then the, the products from the atmospheric distillation is sent to other units. Most of the time you can also, the See like the SR straight run straight run NAFTA straight run means that directly from CDU. So you can call this one SR NAFTA SR kerosene SR diesel SR gas oil. SRGO. I will skip this one because the, we don't have much time for this one. So what is it about uh, briefly? Fractionation is done based on the boiling point. And we have a light cut here. We have heavy cut here. So if we have a gap between light cut and heavy cut, that is perfect. That's perfect for us. It means that it starts from 30, ends at 180, and we have 180, 240. This is the NAFTA. This is the kerosene. If you can do that, this is perfect. But that is not 
nearly possible to the, the perfect here. What we have, we have 30 here. We have the 185 here, 175 here, and 245 here. Then you can see that in NAFTA, we have kerosene left. The gap between 185 and 180 is kerosene. And we have also NAFTA in kerosene. So how you determine that one? You have kind of spec what you should be your aim, what is okay for you, and based on this, you design your distillation form. If you want to have the perfect distillation, you might have ended up the distillation comb with more than 100 trays. The CD pressure. So CD comb is controlled by the back pressure of the overhead reflux drum. Where is it? Yes, here this one. You can see that it is two ATM, which is equal to one bar G. And this is the overhead reflux drum. This is the pressure of the 0 0.3 bar G. This is where you control the CDU overhead pressure. The top tray pressure is 0 0.4, 0 0.7 bar G. And the flash zone, this is, by the way, is video in the photo, not CDU. How I know that, I will tell you later. The flash zone pressure is usually the 0 0.34, 0 0.54 bar higher than the, the top tray. So here, the here, top tray, top tray P plus 0 0.34, 0 0.54 R. So if it is, let's say, the 0 0.7, this is 0 0.5. In the end, we will have the 1.2. It's a bit high. Probably it will not be the case. Maximum is 1 bar G. The overhead temperature, again, the, is around the 15, 20 at the top and 450, 550 in the bottoms, and the bottom is sent to vacuum residue, top is sent to where? Top is sent to overhead the flux drum. We have here 15, 30 degree Celsius. One moment, please, one moment. I'm I'm so sorry. And then we separate the gases here. So what we don't want. So in gases, let's say there is maximum C5 spec in gases, around uh, two weight percent. What does it mean? In gases, we make the analysis, and then out of the, the analysis, we have the result. There should be maximum of C5. 2%. If we have 3%, it means that we are losing naphtha or gasoline in the gases. What we should do, we should decrease the temperature. Decrease the temperature to liquefy the naphtha or increase pressure. That's why it is always desired to have the, the highest pressure uh, at the top as much as possible and lower temperature. Also, we have to consider the, the C4 spec in NAFTA. If it is also more than enough, then you need to decrease the temperature to evaporate the LPG to remove at gas.
the flow rate and capacity. So the capacity of refinery is equal to capacity of CDU. So all the, because all the crude comes to crude distillation unit first, and then it is that the product are sent to different units. So for instance, it can be said that the capacity is 6 MMTA. It means that million metric ton annum. It means that the, the, the capacity of the refinery is to, uh, to refine 6 million metric ton crude per annum. And the crude column is typically designed for 80% loading, and which means that we have the 20% gap. The capacity of the column is limited by the vapor flow rate with a velocity of between the 0 0.8 and 1 millimeter per second, which means that we have vapor here, and until here, it will have the one around one meter per second. For instance, the if you need the residence time of the the one minute, your tall or your column height will be sixty meters. The vapor flow rate increases as the vapors rise from the flash zone to the overhead. Crude oil is coming here. This is the flash zone. It starts to evaporate, and of course, the vapor flow rate increases. To keep the vapor velocity within this limit, we have the pump arounds, which we talked about, which are installed at the several points. So previously, we had one reflux and three pump arounds. To expand the crude capacity, we may add the preflash column. So what preflash column does? We have the preflash column. It takes the bottom of the preflash column as crude oil to CDU and gases like that from uh, let's say middle of the column. This helps us to increase the capacity of the, the distillation column. Stabilizer section. NAFTA we have here, but this NAFTA is unstabilized. Who can tell me what is unstabilized? Unstabilized NAFTA means that we have gases in NAFTA. So gases such mostly LPG plus NAFTA. Stabilizing means that we are sending it to uh, stabilizing column. And we are separating the liquid NAFTA. From gas LPG. But of course, we have here reflux drum. I didn't draw it. We have here the boiler, like a typical distillation column. So we assume this is a, the stabilizing section. We have the gases here, and we cool it down. We have air cooler. We have reflux drum, and again we separate the, the, the LPG as liquid and send the rest of LPG back to column. And from bottom, we have the liquid NAFTA. And liquid NAFTA is sent to NS. It is a NAFTA splitter. And we separate the liquid, uh, light NAFTA. Who can tell me where night NAFTA and uh, heavy NAFTA are rooted? Night NAFTA is due to 
is rooted to isomerization unit. Ev nafta is rooted to continuous catalytic reforming unit. This is the stabilizer section. We have the light nafta. Most of the time we have the heavy nafta. We don't have medium nafta at um, Bakur refinery, but you may have find it in different refineries. The CDU pump arounds. I talked about the pump arounds, saying that we have the the pump around one, two, three, four, and uh, can also count reflux as pump around. My question to you, why we need pump around? I think, uh, for example, we have uh, higher pressure inside the trays and lower pressure uh, between the reflux. And we, we have um, pressure gradient and to overcome this gradient, we need pump. We need to pump it from low pressure to high pressure. OK, that's clear. We want to send the liquid. It leaves from here. The, we need to send it to back to column and for this we need pump because otherwise as you can see we want to send from lower point to higher point we need pump but in general why we need to have pump around what would be if we don't have it we don't have pump around i don't need it can i say this one what's the purpose of pump around The purpose is, I also said it before, to control temperature. To control temperature at different locations. I want to temp control temperature here. <clears throat> I want to control temperature here, here, here. Why? Why? Because these are the points where I extract my product. My product is extracted from here, my product is extracted from here, from here. That's why these are important points for me to control the temperature. For us, a reflux. If I have the, uh, let's say, nafta in gas, it means that I am stripping nafta. I have to cool the, the tower overhead to save nafta. I don't want nafta to live as a gas. That's why what we do, in, increase, increase the reflux, and then decrease the temperature at tower overhead, so that we don't let nafta live as gas. These are all show the, the pump arounds and heat exchanger. Network usually two pump arounds up to three are used in conventional designs for crude distillation units. Sante, can I ask one question? So yes, quick. sure. Uh, we'll, uh, we can put the pump around only after the distillation columns or, or before or after the distillation columns. And in the other sides of the uh, plant, we cannot. I mean that in all distillation columns or uh, stabilizing columns, you can have pump around. Pump around. Thank you for the question. Actually, that is wh where I want to explain it. This is the let's say the distillation column. So what we do, we take it, let's say from 13th tray. We have this one. We have heat exchanger. We have pump. We pump it to 14th or 15th tray. It is 120 degrees Celsius from heat exchanger. It is 100 Celsius. And then you kind of the, the control the temperature. You cool down the 15th tray with this pump around. Exactly, it is happening here. The main column consists of 45 trays. The secondary columns 
consists of four trays each. These are the size strippers. Size stripper one, two, three. For kerosene product, for light gasoil product, for heavy gasoil product. The main column has two sections that are distinguished with respect to the flash zone. Okay, these are the flash zone. Four trays, five, uh, four trays are the flash zone. This is the flash zone. And 41 trays above the flash zone. The bottom most tray is numbered as one. This is one and we go up. So trays 13, 22. 13, 22, a draw of tray. On 10 trays above the HGO processing zone, process the LGO product portion of the crude. From tray 22, from tray 22, we draw of product is taken and sent to LGO side stripper. LGO is sent to side stripper. Another liquid stream is taken out and sent to tray 24. You can see here, this is pump around. We have heat exchanger here and colder LGO stream is sent back to above 24. So it cools down, cools down. If we see that we need to cool down the temperature at 24, we increase the flow rate of this pump around. And basically, when the temperature at 24 decreases, all the temperatures below this tray starts to decrease. So we basically control the temperature between 13 and 22 with the flow rate of this pump around. And it applies the same for, for others. With this pump around, we have no pump around here because the, we save here less energy than gaining. We use more energy for pump around, but it does not affect more. However, we have pump around here. Again, that we control the temperature of these trays with this pump around. Is this clear? Or if you have any question, please ask here. Yes, it's totally clear. Okay. So because we have the similar slides, I will skip them. You can read them uh, later. Vacuum distillation column. Okay. Just three minutes, I will finish vacuum distillation column. I know it is already iftar time in Baku. So in vacuum distillation co uh, column, we have packing, one packing, second packing, third packing, and this is video, and this is the, the, the vacuum generation package. You can see this one. These are two. These are the vacuum generation package, and this is CDU. Here, our main products are VGO, vacuum gas oil. We can have soap and vacuum residue. Vacuum residue is sent to BBU and DCU. And we have the vacuum system. We have the steam ejectors, as you can see. Steam can be used as ejector, or we can use the, the, the diesel product. We can have sometimes the diesel product here and we can use it in the ejectors to create the vacuum conditioner. And the vacuum condition is around the 3050 mmHg. Vacuum overview. As you can see, we have the accumulator here for atmospheric distillation, and this is the VDU. We have the LVGO, HVGO, and VRS products. As I can, as I told you, sometimes we have the diesel here, but the flow rate of diesel is low. This is the shows a steam vacuum generation package. We have the ejectors at the top of the column. The you can see these are the ejector steam ejector package tubing which helps to create the vacuum. You can see the ejectors here. I want to talk about more, but we don't have enough time. We can discuss it in the next session, and I will also send the slides so that you can uh, review and read them. This is the end of presentation.
If you have any questions, please ask. I believe we don't have any more questions because it's already iftar time. So thank okay. you very much for the uh, presentation and especially the presentation, Sanam Bey. I believe each of us learned a lot today from you and we'll have uh, and we'll have additional session with you on Sunday. Uh, yes. Thank you very much for us again and uh, dear participants, uh, thank you again and have a good day. Have a good day. Have a nice Thank you. Thank you. floor. I think. Okay. Bye.